Hi folks, I'm Ron Longwell, and I'm glad you're here today for another episode of the Jesus Society Podcast, a conversation exploring relationship, renewal, and purpose in the kingdom of God. This is episode 66 of the Jesus Society Podcast, and today we're going to continue our Men of God conversation that we uh, that we began a few weeks ago. If you've not listened to the previous two episodes, I'd encourage you to do so. And if I can remember, I will put links in the show notes for the previous two episodes so you can find those easily. We have a special guest in the house today, Brendan Taylor. <sighs> yeah. Whew. Yay, I, was, I was holding my breath until until you introduced me. <laughs> so um, I didn't want I didn't want to just dis, uh, destroy the illusion that I wasn't here. Yes, right, you know, right. to, to the audio listener, right. they had no idea right. until I exhaled that you were lurking so, lurking in the background. I was I was lurking in the background, <laughs> weaving and waving my head in, <laughs> in and out of the crevices of existence. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, Brendan, um, you may remember if you're a if you're a longtime listener of the show, Brendan was my partner in crime for the um, the chosen series that we did last year. Uh, Brendan is um, a dear friend, uh, intrepid drama professor, intrepid, yeah, and uh, and former conversation partner uh, about uh, the chosen. There you go. And uh, and from what I understand, with season two underway. Have you been watching season two? Not yet. I, I think I'm going to wait till it's all finished. Till it's all done. That way, I can I can watch it on my own pace. We're or in my own pace. We've been watching it. Yeah. Um. And the you, you and I talked a little bit about episode one of season two. Yes. And it yes. was it was okay. It was interesting. I didn't I didn't feel like it had the 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 wow kind of impact that episode one of season one had. See, I feel differently. But, but okay. Go, but go uh, that's, ahead. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But the, the 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 subsequent episodes in season two have been outstanding. Okay. They have, okay. I have I have loved it. But I love that I just love that show. I love everything about it. I love the way they they present Jesus. Um Sure. Gosh, every, it's good. It's good. So I, I don't know. We may we may at some point um, circle back around to having another series of conversations about season Oh I, we I think we've set the precedent. Season D. Season D. Part D. Part D. La Chosen. La Chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. I, seriously, I, I think we've set the precedent, and you know, there's no other attorney. There's so no we, attorney back now. So we have so to. We have to. We have to. Yeah. yeah. But I would our, like to wait. Our, and, our and, listeners expect it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So so when the series finishes, not the series, but when the season finishes, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll talk come about back. It. We'll come yeah. back. And, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, listeners, dear listeners. Um, if you have any uh, if any suggestions, we've we've talked briefly about how we might, um, if we do season two of the chosen, if we talk about it, how we might um, go about that a little differently, how we might make our conversations better. Um, so, if you have some suggestions about how you'd like us to approach it, um, the show, um, you can visit us on our Facebook group for the Jesus Society podcast, and feel free to uh, drop some comments there and. Um, uh, we will uh, take those into account, and if they're good, we may actually listen to them. <laughs> if yeah. they're good, if they're good, that's if right. they're not good, yeah, we'll just let we'll just let them sit in the Facebook. That's group right, that's and not right. respond. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'll tell you why I have invited Brendan to be here this morning. Um, so we're talking about we're talking about men, and I, I have shared some of my story in the past couple episodes, and we've talked about the the just the real problem, uh, the struggle with being a man in modern day. And I'll just focus on America, but this is true, I think, anywhere in the West and maybe globally. Um, Brandon has a unique story. Um, and Brandon is, I, now, in truth, just about every man that I know, cl- uh, that I'm close to, has a, has a father story. Has a, uh, yeah, has a unique father story. Yeah, and has had a, 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 a strained relationship or troubled relationship or uh, not quite perfect relationship with their father. I, and I would, I would add to that just real quick to say the stories and how they play out are certainly unique. What's not unique is how we deal with them. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's that's a lot right. Of, there's a lot of common. There's a lot of common ground in how that's men right. deal with things. Yeah, 
So, but go so, ahead. so most everybody I know has has a story um, like this, and and their relationship with their father has affected them. Brendan is one of the few people that has the courage. Few people that I know that that has the courage enough to talk openly about some of this stuff. Ooh, um, there's that word courage. So yeah, yeah, and courage Ooh. is a courage is a funny thing for for men. It's one of the things we don't often have, but. Um, Brendan, but, we, but we know all about it because that's all the stories we ever hear. Right, you got to have right. courage. You got to do the right thing. That's and all right. That. That's right. So, so uh, Brendan, I asked him to be here because I thought he he might actually do it, and sure enough, here he is. Yeah, I showed up. Yeah. So if, if I hadn't have showed up, would you have still recorded? I would have today? just I would have just talked about you. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, okay. I would. Oh, to- I'm glad I can be here for it. I, I would have told your story, and it would have. I would have embellished it and made up lies and oh, all kinds of oh, stuff. Oh, well, that's, what, that's what you want to do on the Jesus Society podcast, right. <laughs> embellish and make up lies. So, Goodness gracious. That's right. That's right. Sounds like a denomination I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or several. <laughs> or or several. several. Anyway. Anyway. So so <laughs> I, I really want to kind of turn Brendan loose to just kind of tell his story of um, his own relationship with his father and what he what he got or, and didn't get from his father and how some of that stuff has affected him you has affected you mm-hmm. and continues to affect you as you as you try to find your footing in in life as a grown up standing on your own two hind legs male yeah in in this yeah. world a, a biped a biped yeah yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I'm gonna kind of let Brendan uh, uh, take the take the floor here and uh, or take the mic as it were, and kind of tell his story. I will probably interrupt at a few points to ask some questions or, or poke around on some things. Well, and and you are you are free. You know this because we've talked about this, but I want to say this for the benefit of the audience. You sure. are free to um, to tell whatever parts of your story you feel comfortable telling, and oh, whatever yeah. parts okay. you don't. You may not, you, you can keep those to yourself. And if I ask a question and you're uncomfortable answering whatever I've asked you, yeah. just say, I don't really want to talk about that. And that's fine. Well, yeah. well I, I will say that is a that is a wonderful precedent for boundaries. Um, so, yeah. I, so I appreciate you putting that out there. Yeah. Um, would, would you ask me a leading question to... Uh, to help me get to, 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 to help to, get the ball rolling. Uh, sure. So uh, this is a simple one, but just uh, tell us tell us about tell us about your father and your relationship with him and what it was like. Um, what kind of father was he? Mm, okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. So um, I, let me. I will. I will preface the conversation with this. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done has been through the lens of a 12 step recovery program, uh, specifically, right. specifically, uh, celebrate recovery, yes. which is a, uh, it's, it's just the same as every other 12 step program. The only difference is that Jesus Christ is the designated higher power. Yeah. Whereas with, uh, with other, with other 12 step groups like AA or a, yeah, AA or C, or CODA or, you know, any of the, yeah. you know, any of the anonymous, you know, quote anonymous groups that yeah. there are. Uh, they they leave the higher power open so that you know whoever the participant is they can choose that for themselves. Right. With celebrate recovery, it's specifically Christ centered. Yeah, and he is the like I said, he is the designated higher power. So give so, us just real quick give give our listeners a little plug for celebrate recovery. Oh gosh, oh, if you, just a just a kind of a quickie. Oh man, a quick plug. If you can if you can do, how do that. You, how do you do that? Um, they're, because because, because okay. ce- celebrate recovery is available uh, all over the place. Like wherever you live, there is a church in your town probably yeah um, that has a celebrate recovery ministry yeah and they're usually open to anybody that wants to come. There's some well you, anyway. But why yeah. is it why is it helpful and and what do you what's the what's sort of the thrust of it and why should why should people consider Participating in Celebrate Recovery if they have one available to them. Yeah, who's uh, it for? That, those kind of uh, oh things. Oh man, who Re- is it? real quick. Who is it for? It's for everybody who feels like they they have to hold a secret. It's for everybody who feels like they they can't be comfortable in their own skin, uh, whether that's with other colleagues at work, whether that's with certain friends, whether that's with family members, whether that's with a spouse. If you if you feel like you have to to 
uh, dodge and hide things from people because you don't want to hurt them or because you don't want to be hurt yourself. There is healing. And here, here's the main draw for, for me. There is healing in going into a space with other fellow people, specifically with other fellow uh, Christians uh, too. There is healing in going to that space and not only sharing your own struggles in a safe place, uh, there is healing in hearing it from other people too. Yeah. Because then you realize, oh, hey, I'm not the only one like this. Yeah. And like, and like, like we were saying, yes, our stories are, certainly our stories are unique. Like, you know, we are individual people, but there is, there is a lot of common ground with, uh, with how people in general deal with things, especially if you're predisposed to, uh, to toxic shame, to like, like I said, not feeling comfortable in your own skin, to uh, certain hangups like perfectionism, codependency, uh, all these, uh, all the all the things that we think are just things that we deal with by ourselves. Right. When we hear other people talk about them, that's that's when we perk up and say, "Oh wow, I'm not the only one." Right. And right. That there's actually a a form of family that starts there. Yeah. Like from that from that openness and transparency. And sometimes you don't get that even in a church setting. I, so, I sometimes have found, you don't get that. I have anywhere. found you often don't get that in a church setting. <laughs> in fact, I had a friend one time yes. who, who was a, a recovering alcoholic and he was heavily involved in AA. And he actually, he said to me one time, and I, I this, this absolutely shocked me when he said it, but I was rather young in ministry at the time. And, and since I, I know exactly why he said it, he said, he just, he was just, kind of exasperated and he said why can't the church be more like AA yeah. that's what he said that's yeah and I thought well what, what do you mean by that and oh, well, what yeah. he meant was people people are open and honest and yeah not so predisposed to pretend yeah yeah exactly that we're you're, some, you're that not, something we're not you're not wearing a yeah, mask right you're not trying to hide right. anything uh like what like one of the sayings is you're only as sick as your secrets yeah and the more yeah. you share those secrets whether it's a uh, you know, when you come to terms with how you feel about certain things, like, uh, you know, how you, how you might feel about a relationship in your life, how you may feel about how you handle things. And you've maybe recently been convicted that maybe that's not the best way to handle things anymore. Right, right. However, you can't change the behavior without taking the steps. Right. <laughs> so that, right. and that's where the 12 steps come in. Yep, so, yeah, that's right. Uh, but, the, but that, that's my, that's my quick sale pitch on it is that there is the elevator pitch there. Yeah. There you go. The elevator pitch. There is, there is healing in going to a space where you can share your, share your hurts, habits, and hangups without condemnation. And there is healing in hearing it from other people as well. Yep. So yep. that's, that's my elevator pitch. And yep. then of course the, the real heal, that's, that's the open, invitation the real healing starts when you start the steps and when you complete the steps which that's going to come up later in our conversation today yeah so okay cool so so yeah that's that's cr and that's the that's the main lens through which i'm approaching this uh this whole thing with my relationship with my dad yeah uh who who did pass away uh, i do want to go ahead and say that he did pass away back in 2018 uh honestly it was uh june 30th so, uh, so we're coming so up. We're, we're coming, coming up, up on, on three that. years. Yeah. So yeah. Um, my relationship with what, my what, dad. What year? Oh, we, what year was that? Two thousand eighteen. Huh. That's the uh, year my dad died too. Yeah. I I think yeah. I remember that. We yeah. I think we kind of talked about that. So yeah. so that's probably going to come up again. Okay. <laughs> in this conversation. All right. All right. Um, man, goodness gracious! And I will and I will preface this too. Uh, whenever I start talking about sad things. Uh, I tend to leak out of my eyeballs. Yeah, well, uh, it's some sort of salty residue. I don't know what to do about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but luckily, we have napkins at the JSP studio that can that can serve as a as a hanky. Yeah, if they need to. Yeah, yeah. Here at the, here at the illustrious JSP studio. At, <laughs> at the illustrious, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna do it now. The illustrious JSP studio on Mink Slide Road. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to get into voiceover acting. Can you tell? I, I can tell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so okay, so, relationship with the father. Yes. Yeah. Oh, is that what you're about to say? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Tell us about tell us about your dad. Yes. Um, so my relationship with my dad was very, uh, very rough, and it's not because I didn't think that he 
or it's not because I thought that he didn't love me. I knew he loved me. The biggest thing was I never knew if the if the affectionate father would would show up or if the rigid father mm. would show up. Yeah. And there's a there's a there's a thing about rigidity that is perceived as uh well I know I know a key word we're going to use in this conversation is warmth. Yeah. Uh paternal warmth. Yeah. The thing about rigidity is that it comes off as coldness. Yeah. It comes off as uh as uh un well, unaffected, unaffected. And un- kind of unavailable. Yeah, and, to, and, yeah. and even though even though uh distant physical availability is is there and physical distance is is close emotional distance and affective distance is very far away yeah is very uh very secluded very isolated yeah and uh and so you so you've got a dad and he's right there in the room with you but yeah. you you don't feel emotionally you don't feel he's emotionally available right yeah right exactly and, well that's the thing sometimes he would be right sometimes he wasn't some and and it's that uh, that's that's what some psychologists call ambivalence hmm. uh, is not knowing uh, at least f- from the perception of the of the child not knowing if the parent whether it's a mom or a dad not knowing if the parent is or which parent you're going to get right not not knowing which parent you're going to get in any situation so yeah because you don't know you don't know at any given moment if I you know if I if I kind of uh, reach out for connection yeah with mom or dad. And are they going to receive me? Yeah. Or are they going to push me away? Yeah. Right? That, yeah. That's it. That's it. And yeah. it, that, um, that created with, as you know, just speaking for me in particular, that created a, that can, that created a very cautious, uh, disposition, a very, uh, anxious disposition. Right. Uh, so, so one of my, one of my character defects now is, uh, and you know, character defect being a, a CR term, uh, or a twelve step term uh is anxiety and and codependency, which I, I think I might have mentioned before, but uh just a, a quick snapshot of codependency is uh letting letting other people's uh actions or or even presence affect how you do things for yourself. Mm. That's that's at at the root core that's what codependency is. And yeah. and that can be very uh, that can be very maladaptive. Yeah, there's a, there's a big word. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's so that ambivalence. You know, getting back to to what what I think I've realized about my relationship with my father is that uh, yeah, I just I never knew which dad would show up. Right. And uh, and there was and there was a time where uh, let's see, just to, just to try to think of an example of how this would have of how this would have played out practically. There was, there was one time where he was working late and, and normally if, if my dad ever drank, he didn't do it around the kids and he, he necessarily wasn't, uh, wasn't a drinker per se, but he did like occasionally have a drink. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I don't know if that's me still in denial about something, but you know, it could be, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, but but from from my perspective and the work that I've done, I I don't think that I would call my dad a drinker. However, he did drink. Yeah, and one night I remember having a, a rough day at school. I, I was probably in middle school or maybe early high school, and uh, one night he came home from a from a late gig from a from a late job, and I was excited for him to come home because I wanted to talk to him about my day and I wanted to I wanted to try to connect with him. Yeah. He came home and before he even walked through the door, I could already smell the alcohol. Yeah. So, so that, that's just, that wasn't a very common occurrence for the alcohol part, but the common occurrence was, uh, me having the expectation of connecting with dad. And then when dad physically arrived, he was not emotionally there or yeah. he, he was yeah. not, um, uh, uh uh, like effectively there, yeah. like you know, his his mind was somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, whether or not it was affected by a drink or whatever, uh, that that wasn't as common. But the the emotional distance that was that was fairly common. Yeah. So and that that uh, that lack of warmth. Right. So and kids kids need that from their dads. Yeah. I mean, they need it from mom too. Um, 
and, and we've talked about this a couple episodes. I think I, I shared a, a quote with everybody from this research study at USC. Um, family cohesiveness or family warmth, particularly when it comes from the father, is a huge, it's the thing that kind of governs um, how well faith is going to be passed on. Yeah. From the from the family to the child, yeah, yeah. it's and and so often I, I talk to guys all the time and it like the, the story for an awful lot of guys and you know this is that they didn't have that warmth with their father, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read something I'm reading a book right now, and I meant to mention this I meant to mention this book last week in the podcast but I forgot to mention it I did put it in the show notes for uh, last week's episode but I'm gonna. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later and read a couple quotes from the, from the book, and then I'll, I'll put it in the show notes again for today. But anyway, um, yeah, but most, most guys just do not feel like they had that availability, that connection, that, that warmth yeah. with their dad. And so it, it tends to leave us um, being very unsure of ourselves. You know, we we don't feel secure in who we are because our dad never made us feel secure in who we are. Yeah, like we get that from dad. Yeah, and and honestly, because the human the human mind is such a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, they're just to just to talk about different attachment styles to parents, and you know, you know, we're talking about fathers here. There's the there's the avoidant, the and this is a like a a psychological. Uh, tool to help you assess, you know, where you are. There was the, there's the avoidant, uh, attachment style. There's the ambivalent attach, attachment style. There's the rigorous attachment style. And then there's the secure attachment style. And the secure is kind of like, you know, the, what is what you want. You That's want, what you want. Yeah. You want the secure attachment and, and the, the rigorous, the ambivalent and the avoidant, those are all, uh, well, those are all shortcomings. Uh, those, yeah, those, less, those, those do not hit the mark. Right. So, right. right. Uh, but I, but I will say this. Uh, just again, speaking from the recovery perspective, even if there is a secure attachment with mom and dad, and even if there is one with specifically dad, uh, you know, you can still fall into some bad relationship habits and some bad. Uh, Especially with with your with that father, even though there is secure attachment, uh, you can you can still develop some bad habits and some sure we're, some, we're some unwanted compulsive behaviors. Right, so. we're, we're we live in a we live in a fallen world, of course, and yeah. and that in the best of families, you know that it's not a guarantee that everything is going to be rosy and wonderful and perfect. Yeah, um, yeah. But boy, you'd rather have a healthy family than a not healthy family. Yes, like your odds yes. are way higher you know, if mom and dad are doing their job. And that does not mean mom and dad have to be perfect. Yeah. Right? Because that's not going to happen. Right? But you can be healthy without having that, you know, yeah. load on your back, feeling it, like I've got to be flawless. It, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And even even with the secure attachment, or, or not even with, but, but with that secure attachment, you're not going out into the world and looking for other people to father you. Right, you're not going out into the world looking for someone else to parent you, and where you have that, uh, you have that. Well, it, it's a need. It really is a need. Like Absolutely, for it's a, a for, need. A, for a growing child, and even for uh, for what some people call adult children. You know, you know, not just physically speaking, but again, emotionally or uh, affectively speaking. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're if you're going out into the world, not having a secure attachment to your parents. You're gonna go out into the world and look for those parents other in other places. Yeah, and that that's where that's where even even more uh, malevolence just builds up. <laughs> right, because you're 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 effectively using people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. like right. your every relationship yes. becomes how do I get what I need out of mm-hmm. this? Oh, and man. and it becomes this is why. This is why I say all the time you you cannot give what you do not have. Yes. You know, we're we're supposed to to bear God's image in the world and be um, 
be for the world what Jesus was, you know, agents of love and blessing and goodness. You can't do that if, if your own uh, needs are so undermet that you, that you just have to try to extract that kind of stuff from everybody else. You can't give when you're taken. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you cannot. Uh, there's, another, there's another saying that's floating, floating around now. You can't pour out of an empty vessel. Yes, yeah. yes, that's right. That's right. So, so it is, you know, one of my one of my critiques of church, and I have many critiques of church. You, you malcontent. You. I am. A, I am a bit of a church malcontent. I am. <laughs> um, you know, ch- churches tend to, at least the ones I've been in, and I've perpetuated this when I was in ministry. I, you know, I've done this myself. We we lay burdens on people. Get out there and evangelize. Get out there and share your faith. Get out there and do the. You got to go door knocking. You got to go. Yeah. Oh heavens! Don't get me started on door knocking. <laughs> but but we we do that. We like we lay those burdens on people, who many if not most of them are simply not capable of of doing that well because they're too shackled by their own brokenness and yeah. their own. You know, some people, if they if you send them out there, they're just going to use people. Mm. Like they're not going to be a blessing. So, so we have to, we have to, um, and and there's a we could get in a quagmire with all this, but you have to do your own work. Yes. You, you I mean, you have to, you have to learn to to live loved. Yeah. Before you can love others. You know, you're not going to do that well if 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 you don't um, if you don't deal with your own stuff. Uh, and there's lots of ways we could talk about that. So 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 for you, what what has um, what has growing up been like for you? Trying to find your place as a oh. man in this world. Ooh. How like how did that? How did the, your relationship with your father? What's the fallout from that in your own life? To, oh, to the man. and and again you share whatever you feel comfortable sharing oh yeah totally uh and, and i'll and i'll go ahead and uh let the, let the listeners know that i that speaking about these things uh there is healing in that as well you know and hopefully whoever is listening will will have some have some healing as i share so i'm, so I'm going to try to be as open as i can okay um what is the fallout man that's a good question um one of the one of the first things that comes to mind because this is what this is what and this might be my recency bias playing into it, but the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, going into a marriage uh, expecting my uh, my wife to be a parent hmm. and ex- expecting my wife to uh, to you know do the things that a parent should have done. And yeah, you know, you know, she, she being a wife, being, you know, being female that, you know, you could say that that might be more uh, related to my relationship with my mom, but, uh, but it's, it's just the same as my relationship with my dad. You know, it's, you know, it's a, it's a parent, it's a, it's a firm figure, uh, in whom there is, uh, they're supposed to, you know, there's what we think there's supposed to be protection and, you know, they're supposed to be looking out if I, if if I'm not, or well, not if I'm not, but since I wasn't securely attached to my to my dad, and I would, spoiler alert, I would say I wasn't securely attached to my mom either. But uh, because uh because I I grew up with those insecure attachments, uh, all the relationships that I've had since then have been in some form or fashion, uh, seeking out and placing those expectations on the other people with whom I have relationships, whether it's just a friend. Yeah. Whether it's uh, you know uh, like a a coworker or a colleague at work or a boss at work, especially if it's an uh, an authority figure, mm-hmm. you know you you wanna you wanna be oh I, oh here's here's a good one and this is something this is from something from the uh, from the step four inventory. So <laughs> so if uh, if you know twelve step if you know twelve step talk you know what I'm talking about. But basically, you you do a spreadsheet of all the rights and all the wrongs that you've done in your life, you know, and you, you can imagine at 30 years that old, could, that could be a long list, you know? Yeah. You know, you, I mean, you know, you think of, and, uh, think of a Christmas Carol with, 
uh, Jacob Marley. Yeah, and all co- his, his coming his out chains. with the chains. Yeah, uh, the step four inventory is taking every chain link and evaluating and naming it, it. and naming yes and naming it. Uh, what some people would call confessing it. Yeah, it's not just something. It's not just the bad stuff that you've done, but it's just it's everything. It's an inventory. It's it's it is an inventory. You're taking stock. Yeah, and you're finding out what's contributing and what's contaminating. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, one of one of the line items in my inventory was I had a boss who, uh, back when I worked at a certain restaurant here in town, I had a boss uh, who I thought that if I could just be on his good side, then nothing bad would happen to me at work. Hmm. That was me projecting a need for a father onto that boss. Yeah. That was... Yeah. And, and that was that was me... And, and here's the thing about inventory is is recognizing your own part in the in whatever's going on. Uh, he he did absolutely nothing wrong. My my boss did. He's a great guy. Uh, I was the one who went into the relationship uh, trying to manipulate it with the expectation that if I can if I can just stay on his good side, then then I'll be safe at work. Yeah, you know, I won't, I won't lose. It. And what does safe at work mean? Well, I won't lose any hours. I'll have steady income. Right. I'll, I'll have the money that I'm wanting to get for it. Right. Not because right. I'm doing my job that I've been hired for, but if I can stay on his good side. Right. That's, that's one of the things that uh, an insecure attachment with my dad uh, led to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. I, I can look at my own life and 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 see how. You know, all all through my life, um, when I have when I have found a a man who I admired, yes, I, I would do almost anything to get them to think well of me. Mm-hmm. And if they didn't, um, that that wrecked me. Yeah, that absolutely wrecked me. I, I'm convinced part of the struggles that I've had in in with some churches has been wrapped around those kind of kinds of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it takes Cuz it a, was it was yet again yet again uh, I, me projecting onto some other guy the the role of father that that he didn't take up and didn't ask for and I didn't you know like he that wasn't his role. Yeah. But I was projecting it on him and expecting him to to be what I needed in a father and if he wasn't that you know there was another piece of evidence that I'm unlovable yeah oh that's it yep yeah that's it we we love we love anything that confirms our deficiencies we love anything that well we don't love it but we well, gravitate to well, it well it's comfortable <laughs> it, it, it's, yeah. it's comfortable and the it, and the familiarity is what eases the pain right right so, yeah. so I mean, yeah, it's not, yeah, we definitely don't, you know, like love it, love it, but we, we love it in the sense that it's comfortable and in that comfort, in that familiarity and in that comfort, that's where we find escape from the pain. Yeah. So, so I, I'll, 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 I'll tell you something. This is confession time again, because uh, okay, this just go. makes me, this is making me think about something I hadn't thought about. Here, let me get you a so, napkin. So <laughs> I, I'm going to, without processing it, I'm going to just dump it. On, oh, oh, uh, here we go. We'll see. So one of one of the things I have struggled my whole life with, all right, this there's a lot of, I'm taking a big risk here dumping this out like hey, this. That's all right. You're being vulnerable. Um, and there's a like I could do a whole big long talk about all this. Um, work, okay, has been something I have struggled with all my life. Not not doing work, but um, my relationship with my job, whatever it was, has always been tenuous. I have always expected, I think. Um, I, I, oh gosh, I, I I think I've expected uh, um, the 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 um, the um, supervisors that I've had to kind of uh, like I've projected father roles onto mm. them, right? Yeah. And I've expected them to act like fathers rather than bosses. Yeah. And when they didn't act like fathers. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and so that has yeah. left me, that has left me with a very, very unhealthy relationship toward employment. Mm. Mm. Okay. How about that? And there's 
Hey, that there is a there is a there's a lot there. there yeah. There's a, a lot, lot there. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah, yep, yeah. Baggage, baggage, baggage. Which, hey, I mean, you know, it it, it took some courage to share that without even processing it. Yeah, I hadn't even processed it. Well, I'm, you know, is 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 the Holy Spirit here? Is, is <laughs> It, well, it's something, two, it's something two or, moving. Two or more. There, there, we, or there's two or more gathered. Hey, right? hey, there you go. So there's there two you here. Go. You, me, and Jesus. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah, I hijacked that a little bit. Well, well, uh, what was, I, I forget, are we just, uh, still talking about the fallout? Yeah. The yeah. fallout. Okay. So, so yeah, so there was this, uh, there was this effect that it had on, on uh, how I viewed my presence at, uh, at work, at any kind of job, and... So, you know, so there's that to it, uh, getting into, uh, romantic relationships or what we would call, you know, romantic relationships, you know, courting or dating or whatever. Um, uh, honestly, I, I didn't do a lot of that. I, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily the, the roused about and kind of, kind of guy. I was more the shy, quiet guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and I don't know if. If that was because I, at, this might be some some on air processing for me, I I don't know if that was because I didn't feel like I was worthy of a relationship. I didn't know if um, if if I felt like I would have hurt somebody else. Uh, I I do know that in the midst of all that, uh, what I saw at home was how Dad acted around Mom, and. Uh, for I guess I guess for some reason Dad felt like he had to walk on eggshells around Mom. Uh, one of the w- one of the rules one of the rules that he was rigid on on the early years, and, I, and I'll I'll have a comment about rigidity here in a second. Uh, but one of the rules was, don't make Mom mad, don't make Mom sad. Mm-hmm. He didn't. He didn't necessarily say it like that, but that's that's basically what it was. That's what you, you know. That's what you got. That's, that's what, what I got. It was yeah. like you know, don't upset mom. You know, don't you know, don't make her cry or anything. You know, and it, and it wasn't like he, it wasn't like he ever just you know sat me down or sat us down because I have two siblings too. He he didn't like just you know collect us up one Sunday afternoon and say, all right guys, we're gonna have a family meeting, and uh, <laughs> and you know with mom present, he didn't say one of the rules of the house yeah. is don't make mom sad. Don't make mom mad. Yeah, it wasn't ever like that. It was always, you know, she she was never present when when he would say things like that. It was uh, pulling pulling us off to the side and say, "Hey, look, you know that that, that kind of stuff worries your mom. Don't 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 do that." Yeah, you know, it was so so and and benefit of the doubt, and that's something that you know you got you got to have some grace on. Uh, benefit of the doubt, he thought he was making the right decision. Yeah, right. You know, he thought he was trying to keep mom from getting hurt or keep mom from getting upset. The thing is, that's not letting life be life. Right. And that's that's when you start getting into manipulation. And uh, even even if it's not intentionally uh, bad, like you're not like trying to do something that you know is wrong, he's trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, I just know that... That. So so, how has that affected? Because um, you started off kind of drawing a, a string between that and your your marriage. Am well, I, I'm going to get there in just a second. Get there. Okay, I'm going to get there in just a second. Actually, I'm rushing. The yeah, thing. no, it's all it's all yeah. good. Uh, I, I I being the drama guy that I am, I believe in the importance of exposition. So <laughs> so, so you're crafting a tale. So yeah. so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm crafting a narrative because the, the one thing I don't want to do, and this is something that I've I've had to come to terms with. The one thing I don't want to do is villainize my father. Yeah, right. You know, right, is right. you know, assume assume the best intentions. Yep. That's that's something that's crucial because yeah. otherwise you're just in a in a spiral of resentment and Yeah, well and that's that's you know, you heard my story about my dad a few, a few weeks ago and that yes. was for a lot of years that's what I did. I villainized him. Mm-hmm. And um, part of my own healing was coming to understand him to the point that I could see no, he's not the devil. He's he's hurting. He's he's exactly. got his own hurts exactly. and brokenness exactly. that he's he doesn't know how to do this any better than I do. Yeah, you know he's doing what he thinks is best, but he doesn't have any he doesn't have any resources. Nobody he didn't have anybody to teach him how to do this. So so yeah, it, it was it it enables me to be enabled me to be a lot more sympathetic. Yes, that's toward him. That's the key. Yeah, and not villainize him, which that's never that's not helpful. Yeah, you know to assume. 
that this this man in your life is is the devil and he's trying to be the devil and that he doesn't care and that you know there are some people for whom I'm sure that's true. Yeah. But I think most guys, what I know about guys, most guys are just carrying their own freight mm-hmm. and trying to figure out how to make life work. And they don't, they don't have any better guides or examples than any of us do. Yeah. And so they're going to make mistakes. And it's not that they're bad guys. It's just they're blind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, and they're feeling their way in the dark. It's like they they haven't been given the tool set to know how to deal with that freight. Right, um, right, and that's where that's where most of our us uh, us are. I, I, yeah, I have been that way. You have been that way, mm-hmm. and that's what we're trying. Have been, uh, still are. <laughs> still yeah, are. And that's that's one of the things we're trying to kind of unpack in this little series, and try to hopefully provide some direction and hope. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, well, just to just to pick it back up with a with a glimpse into my dad's childhood. Uh, you know, growing up, he was he was born in uh, in fifty nine. He was uh, he, I think he graduated high school. I think he said in seventy seventy four. So that that seems either seventy four or seventy six. Some, somewhere somewhere in the seventies. You know, going going yeah. in high school. Uh, his his mom was a was a hard drug addict. Oh wow! Uh, at the time, and his dad was his dad was again, you know, doing what he thought was best. He was the worker. He was the provider. Uh, my dad never talked about anything emotional with his parents, but through some of the actions that he described, it, the, I could tell that there was some emotional coldness. Yeah, and em, in emotional uh, rigidity. Yeah. So, so just for example, uh, my dad, you know, he was in Boy Scouts. He was, uh, he, one weekend when in, in high school, he, he earned his Eagle Scout badge and there was the ceremony for that and everything. And he, uh, he went home after the ceremony and, you know, like, you know, Boy Scout ceremonies are weird. Yeah. Uh, there, right. was, there was face paint involved in this one. Uh, <laughs> and he got home, he got home and his, uh, his mom, my grandmother was, uh, was drugged out, uh, hyperactively drugged out. Like she was like flitty. And, uh, when she saw the face, the face paint on his face, uh, she apparently, this, and this is a story from my dad. So I wasn't there, but you know, uh, yeah, this is yeah. how he, he described it. When she saw the face paint on his face, she broke down into tears and just started screaming. What have they done to my baby? What have they done to my baby? And all, and all that, you know, she was she was drugged out of her mind, mm-hmm. you know, on on whatever she whatever she could find. So, which you know, again, not to not to villainize her either. She was dealing with life the way that she sure. knew how. So, sure. so so that's that's the assumption. But knowing that that's where he came from, uh, like you said, does help me have a lot of sympathy for him and yeah. a lot of uh, affection. So, yeah, because most of this stuff, if we if we have eyes to see, we realize it's generational. Yes, it's oh, just yes. you know, um, my my dad didn't get from his dad what he needed, and and I know because I know some backstory. My grandfather didn't get from his dad what he needed. Yeah, um, like it's just it's a cycle of it, it is uh, of uh, brokenness and and unavailability. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I, and it was it was. I don't know. I, I want to say it was worse in the early 20th century when things were tough and people were going through depression and, you know, the only thing you had energy for was trying to put bread on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that spawned, and you and I talked about this the other day, it spawned a, a picture of manhood, mm-hmm. I think, for a yep. lot of men yep. that my primary role for the family is to be the provider. Right? Yes. And... That's that's my one job. So I'm going to pour myself into that, and and be the best provider I can be, and and then basically check out from the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And that if I do that part well, I'm I'm okay. You you paid your dues. I paid, you paid the dues. bills. Yeah, and it's the wife's responsibility to raise the kids and provide the emotional support and mm-hmm. and do all the other domestic stuff and and yep. family rearing stuff. And I'll just make sure there's a roof over their head and and clothes on their back and food on the table. And I, I want to say, and I think you would agree, fathers need to be more than that. Yeah. 
Oh, totally. Much more. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so to pick it back up, that's my dad's exposition. Uh, how that translated into my family of origin with my mom and my dad. Uh, like I said, you know, there were, there were rules, there were those unspoken rules with, uh, with both parents. It was, uh, you know, don't make mom sad. Don't make mom mad. Um, and then, and, and, you know, sometimes likewise, mom would say, you know, don't upset your father, you know, th- you know, just general, you know, not to say you know, like ideal statements, but you know, they were, they were like unspoken rules and then sometimes they were spoken. Yeah. Um, uh, it was, uh, Let's see. Not necessarily walking around, walking on eggshells the entire time, but again, just depending on which on which side of my dad showed up, that would determine whether or not I went into uh, hyperactive anxiety cautious mode, mm-hmm. and you know that would that would determine how I acted when he was around, and that that was that was that was young little Brendan uh, trying to make the best of his situation, You're just trying to cope. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. So, uh, how that then translates into my marriage, uh, and you know, I've, I've, I dated, I dated Storm for about, let's see, I think, I think we went on our first date in 2017. She says that we were dating long before that, but I, I remember. In her mind, she <laughs> in, was dating in, in, in her <laughs> mind, she, she was already trying to set the hooks in. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, we, we joke about that now, actually, um, but you know, we we started dating in the spring of seventeen, and we we got married last year in twenty twenty. So you know, we dated for a good three years, and then finally in a in a in a delightfully small little in a COVID in a, COVID wedding in a in a lovely in a lovely COVID wedding uh, where the reception was pizza. Yeah. Uh, so it was it was it was just, it, it it was actually a very nice wedding. Yeah. Um, and we were, we were so so uh, so I so it. I understand. So, yeah, since since yeah. I was invited and then disinvited. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did, did you did you talk to Josh? Did he say, <laughs> so oh man. So so yeah. So okay. So listeners, just to let you in on the joke, uh, we we did have like a somewhat of a larger wedding plan, but then when the when the pandemic struck, the worldwide global the, the global pan- unprecedented unprecedented pandemic. pandemic yes. Um, when that, when that happened the way it did, of course, like I, I proposed to storm on new year's Eve and then we set the date for May 30th. So that's so, so later that spring, uh, for our area. And this, I think this was, you know, essentially worldwide. It was about March of 2020, the middle of March, 2020, when, when things went to pot. Yes. So, so, yes. so once so the world caught fire. Exactly. Yeah. Once that happened, uh, you know, at, at first there was the there were the hopes that it would all be over in a week or two. Yes. And then once those week or twos kept growing into week or threes or week or fours, yeah. or you know, it kept going. We eventually came to the decision. Well, we we can't really in in good consciousness in good conscience we can't have a huge super big party wedding like we wanted to. Well. She didn't really want a big party wedding. I wanted a big party wedding because yeah. I because I wanted to see the people I love. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, instead of doing that, we actually so we we sent out the invitations early that spring. We sent out disinvitations <laughs> uh, later that spring, uh, closer uh, closer time to the wedding. Yeah, uh, and you know, one of uh, one of Ryan and I's mutual brothers. Uh, he he likes to joke a lot about getting that disinvitation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, so yeah, that's that's that story. So uh, how does how did my relationship with my father affect my marriage? Uh, seeing the way that he acted around mom, uh, you know, treat, treating her almost as if she were a child herself, mm. trying to and and that may be something that was a part of their relationship that I may not fully understand right now, but there, there was that, that hyperactive, anxious, cautious demeanor of, you know, maybe, maybe it was a rule for us because it was a rule for him. Don't make my wife sad. Don't make my wife mad. So I got to tell the kids, don't make mom sad. Don't make mom mad. You know, you know, that was, uh, that was, that could have been a part of his, uh, way of operating in the world. So I carried that 
into my marriage. Yeah. And that's something that I'm still working on because there'll be times when, when I don't share something with her and this is, we were even talking last night about it. Uh, you know, this, this is just something that, this is one of my habits uh, that if, you know, if there's some important bit of news that affects both of us, then I, I try to keep it from her just so, you know, I, I'm afraid it'll hurt her or I'm afraid that it will, it will affect how she treats me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, so yeah. it's, there's, there's plenty of selfishness and self pity wrapped up in that. Right. Right. Uh, wrapped up in, in the, and that's a form of manipulation. Yeah. Uh, withholding information in order to change the effect into something that you desire. Right. right. So, 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 yeah, that's so it's something. not, it's not honest. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not, not honest. Yeah. You know, we, we, we all want the kind of relationship with, the, the people we're closest to where we are fully known and where we fully know them and we're fully known by them. Right. It's, it's a, where I don't have to hide anything and I don't have to pretend that we all want that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where I can totally be myself. I can say what's on my heart without fear of reprisal or, or whatever. We want that, but golly, <laughs> we bring a lot of baggage into, into all that. And yeah. it's, it's, that is harder to achieve than it, we make it harder to achieve than it than yeah. it should be. Well, yeah. uh, we we learn survival techniques. Yeah, and we and we we rely on those survival techniques. Uh, well, un- until we're shown something better. Yeah, and we and we learn a lot of those. I mean, we learn those from our family. Yeah, I, from yes. our the family we grew up in. Mm-hmm. You know, and for guys, we, we you know we learn how to be fathers from our father. We learn how to be husbands from our father. Yeah, or we don't. Yeah, or yeah. Uh, I mean, we yeah we learn it whether it's good or bad. We, that's that's I, I, often. I, I was just about to say um, how we how we approach things. Yeah, uh, there's, you know, there's that Bob Dylan quote. Everyone everyone quotes Bob Dylan as saying this. You know, you, you got to worship something. Uh, I want to I want to take out the word worship and I want to put in the phrase uh, pass on. You're going to pass on something. Yeah. Speaking yeah. to fathers, you're going to pass on something. Yeah. Whether it's good or bad, you're yeah. going to pass it on. Yeah. If that's um, if that's something you want to recon- reconcile with, <laughs> you know, cause, cause you know, I'm, I'm not a dad yet, Yeah. but I know that I'm going to pass on, I'm going to pass on something to my kid. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. So, so my, know. my answer to all that, because you're right, you know, none of us are going to do this perfectly. And I see a lot of first time parents, boy, they buy 400 books and read them all and listen to every, bo- watch it, you know, read every blog post and YouTube video. And like they just, because they, they think, they feel insecure in, about their ability to be parents. Every first-time parent feels that way, yeah. and they're trying to they're trying to level the playing field a little bit. But they kind of, I think, have this idea: if I can just get the knowledge that I need, I can be this perfect parent. You're not going to be the perfect parent. But here's the key, and the key comes from Scripture. Oh, tell us about it. Right, the 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 trick in in good parenting. I mean, there's. You want to be honest. You want to you want to be responsible. You want to raise your kids with, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Bible says um, you have to. I'm a big believer in what Dobson said years ago that you 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 discipline for disobedience and disrespect. Those are the two things. You don't discipline for other for spilling the milk or or accidents or whatever. Disobedience, disrespect. Those are your, those are your discipline triggers. But but the big thing is what Jesus says, not in the context of parenting. Um, um, now, I, I just, it's, I've just gone blank. Um, oh, love covers a multitude of sins. Mm. That's your key. Make sure, your, make sure your relationship with your kids is warm, warmth, Right, because love is going to overcome a lot of that. If your if your kids know that you love them, you can make all kinds of mistakes, and they they will still grow up to be secure, stable, yeah, adults. Yeah, and and I would, I would just just to add to that because language is a funny thing, and we hear the word love, and our mind can go. Into many different directions. Yes, uh, yes. To, Love needs defined. Well, yeah. Well, sure. well, just to just to add a qualifier to that, uh, my my sponsor uses the phrase, you know, make sure you're, make sure that the kids know you love them, but make sure 
your kids make sure your kids know that you love them and then make sure that your kids know that you've got their back. Y- yes. In the, in terms yeah. of not just phys- uh, physical support or supplying physical needs, but emotional support. And even, right. even in times where they feel like they disagree with you on something, even if it's something that they are afraid of, uh, especially like if they're afraid of how you will react, you know, you know, qual- qualify the love by saying there is, there is nothing that you can say or nothing that you can do that will make me love you any less. That's right. That's and right. that, and that like, and sometimes we feel like that goes without saying. Yeah. But saying it really does a world full of good. And, and back it up with practice. With practice. With, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, the, it's not just orthodoxy, it's orthopraxy. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So as Ron takes a uh, cordial sip from his mug. Yeah. Which is now, my coffee is cold now. Oh, but man. Anyway. You go in the world to get your podcast. We are probably there. Um, and if you... If you rate and review us, um, and and like that, that really helps. It helps um, uh, other people find the podcast. So, if you have found this valuable, please just take a minute and do that. Um, please visit us on our Facebook page um, for the Jesus Society podcast. You can search and you'll find that. We've also got a group um, for the Jesus Society podcast. Uh, Also, want to let you know, um, check out our website, thejesussociety.com, which we are in the process of updating and redesigning uh, to be a a true kind of one-stop shop for everything uh, related to uh, the Jesus Society, our our ministry, um, which, uh, of course, includes this podcast. So um, be watching for that. It's, It's you're probably not going to find it at thejesussociety.com right at the moment. We're we're in the middle of all that, but um, but do be looking for that. And when it when it when everything finally does go live with the redesign, we'll we'll be sure and let you know. Uh, also, as we continue to try and grow the audience, we're uh, loading all the episodes of the Jesus Society podcast onto YouTube and Odyssey. Um, Odyssey is the kind of alt tech platform, um, so you can find us there. Uh, and if you search for the Jesus Society podcast on either of those places, you'll uh, you'll find us. If you'd like to support uh, our show and our related ministry, we've added a Patreon page, and that would really be a blessing uh, to us if you found this helpful and and um, and you can donate just a, a buck or two or three or four or five a month. Uh, that would be a big help. Um, and so there's a link in the show notes to our Patreon page. Um, you can uh, you can visit us there. Thanks for listening, and remember, you are greatly loved.